the first time I saw her on stage, I wondered how did the lighting designer get that actress to glow from the inside. But it wasn't long before the entire theater community realized that the star brings that glow with her. Welcome to Women in Theater. I'm Linda Weiner, theater critic and arts columnist of Newsday. And our guest is Cherry Jones, who for more than a decade has challenged reviewers to find different ways to describe her radiance. Isn't that gooey? I mean, it's a but spotlight. It's, but it's, no, no, it's true. I could, there's always in my notes this thing, radiant. And then I go back and think, I can't say radiant again. I said radiant last time. It's a, have you ever had to play someone dull? Oh, well, Can I, you turn the light off? <laughs> We don't, I, I, really, I mean, I know what you're saying, but, but, and I thank you for that, but a lot of it really is, but once you get to a certain level in the theater, you notice they always throw a spotlight on you, which I'm realizing now I hate so much because you can no longer see the audience at all when you have that spotlight on you. You can't even, you don't even, it's just a black, it's just a black. You can say, you can say what you will. First of all, you <laughs> weren't at that point when I saw you that they, <laughs> <laughs> it was in Our Country's Good, oh. which was when you got your first Tony nomination, and it was 1990. One. And, uh, one, I think. One. Yeah, yeah. And you were, were you living in New York then? Uh -huh. or you had, you had just moved to New York yeah. from, from. Uh, I had just done, uh, well, I had, I had been up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the American Repertory Theater for, for almost all of the 80s, I think six, six out of ten seasons. And I would come back and forth a little bit to New York, but then uh, in uh, 90, I came back. Uh, to New York and was in a New York Theater Workshop production of Light Shining in Buckinghamshire ooh, uh, that ooh, Lisa Peterson uh, directed. Everyone loved that. I thought it was a hair shirt of a play. Yeah, I think <laughs> they were glowing in that one too. It was a, it was a hard one, but yeah. the, you, you, there might have been a little yes. moments of dullness uh -huh, in that uh -huh, one. I got uh -huh. to play a dull mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. Bottle washer. I remember this wonderful oh. woman who washed bottles. But, uh, uh, and then, and then, uh, uh, and I'd had knee surgery, uh, reconstructive knee surgery because of an injury up at ART. So I was able to limp in Light Shining in Buckinghamshire, and then I was able to limp in uh, Our Country's Good. So that got me through my my period of, of knee surgery. This is great. You know, beast this of burdens. It's on the photo with it, you know, and limp, good limp. Right. Glows <laughs> and, and limps. <laughs> now, um, this season you you have been in um, in Imaginary Friends, uh, Nora Ephron play, that that didn't quite get the reception that I thought it deserved. You played Mary McCarthy with with Susie Kurtz as Lillian Hellman, and I'm curious about. How crushing is it when something that good doesn't get the response it should? Well, you know, it, I think for anybody who really loves what they do, it's the process and it's the rehearsal process and it's the community and it's going to work every night. And what's crushing is that, you know, eventually you don't get to go to work with those people anymore. But that's always how it is in the theater, whether it's a huge success, it eventually closes someday. So, uh, and we've been together uh, uh, for many many months and so uh, it's it's uh, it's disappointing I'm disappointed uh, uh, for Nora because I Nora I, Ephron for yeah. Nora Ephron because uh, I really I believe in the beautiful theatricality of the piece I think it's a it's like a literary variety hour uh, slash cautionary tale about passionate pettiness and where it gets you uh, and and I think the piece is something that I think by the end of the first act you have no idea what it is or where it's going and by the end of the second act it's it's uh, it's really giving you something to think about and is taking you somewhere so yeah. I enjoyed it a lot when Thanks. I was going back and thinking thinking back on the your recent career in New York and so many of the plays were not to to um, put too much of an emphasis on women in theater but you've really been doing plays by women, um, and this yes, I have. you really have, yeah. and maybe it's because women are the only ones writing strong women characters. But you had Tina Howe in *Pride's Crossing*, yeah. where you played um, Mabel Tidings Bigelow, swimmer, uh, channel, sw channel swimmer, 1923, um, yeah. and through her whole life. Yeah, yeah. and then um, and then right after that, you were an aviatrix, mm. right? You were right, that's right. In <laughs> Ellen McLaughlin's play *Tongue of a Bird*, and um, and 
I, in both of those, I, what I started to think is, is it possible that she's go, that Cherry Jones is going to start to get typecast as warrior woman, you know? Well, as, I, I think probably I was, <laughs> <laughs> certainly was for a while there. Uh, 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 and and uh, let's see, there was Baltimore Waltz and, and a couple of, of, I did three of Paula Vogel's uh, plays. So there was, there's been this great period of getting to yes. work, work with these great women playwrights. The warrior woman thing, I think I was I was born to it because I, I grew up in the woods in Tennessee and we would, you know, have our wooden swords and our ropes and our creeks to splash in and we were always, I was sort of always playing warrior woman in the woods. So this is Paris, so, Tennessee? Yes. Can yes. you say something in Tennessee for me? Can, when did you lose it? Can you say penguin? That's the only thing I that that, that I, I'm so that I'm so good usually with but when I see penguin it just comes Pingu out penguin good, it good, doesn't good. yeah and yellow and you know I, where I come from it's more of a it's kind of a West Tennessee twang and it's more it's it's not the the cotton belt it's just above and more the tobacco and soybean and corn belt so uh, which you know of course the whole southern dialect is is dependent on and the unfortunate, uh, to say the least, history of our country of slavery and the black influence in the dialect, which completely changes the white dialect. And it's incredible because you can just follow the, basically you follow the crops and you know what the dialect should be because of, of the tremendous influence. Um, How did you come out of the woods? to end up on Broadway? Uh, well, I just, you know, I always knew I wanted to, to be an actress, and I had a wonderful creative dramatics teacher when I was a little girl. Uh, she was the, the saint of our t hometown. She taught everybody creative dramatics and elocution and Miss Ruby Kreider. And then uh, when I was 16, I, I got accepted in the Northwestern um, Cherub Program at, at Northwestern University when I was 16. And is that, that's where you saw Moon for the Misbegotten? That's where I saw Moon for the Misbegotten. I was at the Chicago Tribune then, you little girl. Oh, oh so my I, God. <laughs> that was at, um, at Lake in Lake Forest. Forest. Yes. Yeah, they did wonderful work there. Oh. That was supposedly, that was the, um, the Colleen Dewhurst Moon for the Misbegotten that you have said meant so much to you at yeah. the time. Yeah, and Jane Greenwood, who was was uh, who did the costumes later, uh, of, th she said that that was literally that was sort of a workshop production what we saw that summer in Lake Forest, but that was it. As soon as I saw Colleen Dewhurst do that, you know, then I thought, wow, the sky's the limit. And, and then of course you, you don't you have to play be an ingenue. Role. You can yeah. you know you can be a big, large, strong woman and and. Uh, so that it just opened up a world of possibilities for me as an actor. And from there, you went to Carnegie Mellon. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to do a little little bio thing, little bio thing. And then, but then you were accepted into the very first, the inaugural year at ART at American Repertory Theater with Robert Brewstein, which is amazing. I mean, you had star roles from the start. Well, it, well, yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> come on. I yeah. shouldn't have because I didn't know what the, in the world I was doing. I was 23 years old and. I'd done one season at BAM uh, when David Jones mm -hmm. ran BAM that first season, and uh, and then I wasn't asked back for the second season, and I was crushed. Oh, and, good. And, uh, Who's sorry uh, now? Uh, huh? uh, <laughs> exactly, because I mean that's where I grew up. ART was. I mean, I hope that that every actor uh, could could work with a group and live with a group and and fall in love with a group that they could create with for many many years and and learn the craft that way. Um, and to play classics, and you really did an apprenticeship there, you know, yeah. 20, 25 yeah. productions. And that's that's exactly, I'm sorry, I just looked into that spotlight, and I'm now completely blind. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it is was she, sliding is down. She and, uh, is she glowing? Is she glowing? No, she's stunned. Uh, it, huh? it's, it really is the... It's the greatest way to learn your craft because oh. you're on a you're on a team and you know you learn how to support each other and and uh, you, you know if and also in a regional theater if a show doesn't go so well you know in a few weeks you can pack that one away and start something fresh and and uh, so it's a great place to learn. And so by the time you got to New York, you weren't a baby and no. you weren't an amateur and you weren't going to learn on the stage. So it must have been kind of shocking when you were cast <coughs> in The Heiress on Broadway, and there were suddenly several reviews who said, 
who is this woman? <laughs> Where did she come from? She was obviously just hatched. Yeah. And wasn't, wasn't that what Dustin Hoffman got when he <laughs> played the graduate or something after however many years in New York of working on, on this thing? I, it, was a, it was just a, it was like being Cinderella at the ball, you know, because I was this good old workhorse who'd been plugging away. And, and suddenly to have, I mean, the, the thing about the, the theatrical celebrity is it's quite small and manageable relatively speaking and I knew that it was going to allow me to work as an actress in my 40s because I was going to be better that was known the turning because point, I, really. yeah yeah I was 38 when I when I played Catherine Sloper so that was it was terrific to but that production was so mag Jerry Gutierrez was like a laser beam you know he just he just knew exactly what was required to to uh, take people on quite a theatrical ride and when you got your Tony Award, it was the first time that a lesbian thanked her lover on the stage Apparently. on t national TV, which then made you the first out lesbian Broadway star, supposedly. Yes? Yes, and so I always felt so... I always carry felt a little so sandwich. Well, sandwich. I felt so bad yeah, about it because I, I named Mary at the, at the end of this long list of other people <laughs> I named. I barely got her name in, and then suddenly, you know, people who'd been waiting, I guess, for a moment like that, were so pleased that that it had happened. So, uh, I was, I was. I mean, that was the Ares was the first time that I got in any kind of national press, and I remember um, uh, the the first time I was asked about my personal life, and it was like a neon sign was over the interviewer's head saying, you know, here it comes, here it comes, and I thought, well, I've, I've never lied about it before. Why am I going to? Nobody start cared now? before, right? right. Nobody, yeah. and, and I'm in the theater. I'm not in film. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't matter in theater because. Well, so you once said, I, I came out of the womb a happy gay person. Yeah, I really I love did. That. So I even did. In, I, in the South and border well, states and. You know, I didn't, I didn't, uh, certainly in the, the 19, late 60s and 70s when I was first realizing that I was different from, from most of my other friends, I didn't talk about it then, but I, I uh, finally. Well, my mother finally asked me when I was 25 if I had trouble with men or if I didn't like men. And I said, oh, Mama, I love and adore men, but you know how much Judy means to me, which, who was the woman I was, I was with. And she, um, we had an amazing talk that night, and it was very difficult for my parents, as it is for any, any parents of a gay child. But through, through the years, everyone comes to... I mean, my parents now, I think, are, are thrilled I'm gay because they wouldn't know Mary O'Connor, my partner of 17 years this weekend. <laughs> who's who's so. the architect of the... Uh, uh, the Bay Street Theater and now the Abingdon Theater and, and uh, yeah. hopefully one in Hoboken soon. And, yeah. 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 So... Uh, and but I understand there was there was a whole controversy in the local paper. Oh, you? yeah. That was, that was kind of fun. There was a... a um, the New York Times did an article that, that the, my hometown paper, the Paris Post Intelligencer, uh, reprinted faithfully every word of it, and in it, uh, my Mary is mentioned as my my sweetheart, <laughs> and so the, there were letters to the editor saying, you know, happy for Cherry's success, not her lifestyle, and then Leviticus, 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 and and but it was it was wonderful because it got the entire community. Uh, there were these letters being fired back and forth. And until that point, it never occurred to me that there would ever have been anyone in my hometown who would have written a supportive letter about homosexuality. And it was terrific because it meant that all those young gay people who think they're the only people there in Paris, Tennessee, started to realize that not only are they not alone in their sexuality, they are also are wonderful people who, who are there to support them. And um, And increasingly, it was the the angry, sort of hateful people writing the, the mean, angry letters who were sounding rather lonely. So it was a terrific thing for the community. That's and I got to be the Grand Marshal of the world's biggest fish fry parade. So The world's, the this world's was the change. In this was the dream in your life, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the dream. Well, I know Paula Vogel, too, and uh, you've done a lot of Paula Vogel's plays, the, <clears throat> who won a Pulitzer Prize for, for How I Learned to Drive. Yeah. But the play that was the breakthrough for me, and, and uh, in terms of both you and 
and Paula mm -hmm. was Baltimore Waltz, yeah. which she has said was, even though she won a Pulitzer for the other one, that Baltimore Waltz is really, she felt if she had written nothing else. Yeah. And could you talk a little bit about the experience of Baltimore Waltz? Well, I, and I agree with her. I, yeah. I, I loved how I learned to drive, but the heart and the passion in Baltimore Waltz is, I mean, I think that's a little play that's going to be produced over and over again because, I mean, people, it, it was probably, if it's categorized, it's categorized as an AIDS play, but it's not. It's a, it's a memory play and a play about loss and, and the love of, uh, well, in this case, Paula's love for her brother, Carl Vogel. And I remember when I first got that script, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm bright enough, I get by, <laughs> but I'm no intellect and I'm not good at reading uh, plays. And, and I remember Mary saying, oh, I think this has a lot of potential. And I, I remember a week into rehearsals, I said to Joe Mantello, who was, who was still acting in still those acting. days, and so brilliantly, uh, I, I said, I, I've got to, they've got to fire me. I don't know what in the world I'm doing. I don't understand it. And he said, trust this play. It has a heart of its own. Just commit, just trust it. He was already directing, as yeah. you see. And you really, and the whole, you took your brother on a trip to Europe but actually what happened is it was all done in the, it was in your mind at his hospital yeah, bed. Yeah, it's, it's a play that basically takes place in a synapse of a moment, in the moment a woman learns that her brother is dead. And in it she takes this fantasy trip where she's the one who's ill and needs, and needs a miracle cure. And her brother takes her to Europe for that miracle cure and it becomes increasingly uh, fantastical and then you end up back at Johns Hopkins Hospital with the brother in the hospital bed and and uh, and then there's this magnificent coda at the end of the play that oh it's just it was breathtaking. 92 I think 90 yep. around the, yep. and it I remember I feel like it, I just saw it it was that kind of experience and you know I go to way too many plays a, a week and you know don't remember things like that but Baltimore Walls and your performance in it well that's the only one of Betty Corwin's I always think of them as Betty Corwin's films of theater that's the only one uh, that I've actually seen at Lincoln Center at the at Performing the Arts Library because I just missed it one day I just had to go see it because oh. I missed it so much yeah did you think for a while that then once you were this out lesbian that there was going to be uh, a typecasting where it seemed to me for a while you were only going to play spinsters and saints. Yeah, you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah that you were um, that you were Hannah in Night of the Iguana. <coughs> yeah, and you were in the Heiress mm -hmm. and several others where I started mm -hmm. to think, are they ever going to let this woman have a sex life now? Yeah. And did you find that resistance? Well, I don't think it was because I was gay. I think it was just because. Um, uh, they were strong, beautiful women's parts, and, and I just probably did one too many of them. <laughs> I mean, they were all roles I loved, I loved to play. And it's true, they were all sort of single women, and there's a great deal of freedom and, uh, of playing single women in theater. It's when the gals are married that often they're, they're um, I mean, nothing against Hedda Gobbler, or, yeah. or, but it seems like, all the women who are married in theater are desperately trying to get out of their marriages. Uh, the whole and, mad housewife genre. Yeah. One of yeah, the faves. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but the, the single gals uh, have, a, have a stronger, more interesting path. It's, you're always, sh it's like being shot out of a, a bow and you don't know where you're going when you're the heroine. But, uh, and, and everyone else on stage is an obstacle. Uh, almost everyone. You have very few allies on stage when you're the heroine. Everyone's there to, to uh, trip you up, and it's so it's kind of a it's a very mean, lean course that you're on, and it's fascinating that way. But I'm I'm looking forward now to getting older and getting to learn how to do character work because I haven't I haven't ever I, I've been so lucky to get to play these great leading women that now I need to start working on my character skills and I've sort of been able to do that a little bit in film. I, I think of that as my well-paid workshop, you know, <laughs> towards character. <laughs> the veterinarian in, in, in a Horse Whisperer? Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Is it true that you, mm. when, they, when you got the call about the heiress, that you thought they wanted to cast you as the aunt? Well, that's what my agents told me. I, I w you know, the, and, and I remember reading this 
this play and I couldn't put it down. I'm a very slow reader and I don't like to read plays that much because I'm just not a good reader. And I, and I was just flipping through it and I thought, oh, there are too many brilliant 50-year-old women who are right for this role and boy, they must be cast a young if they want me to. I remember thinking, oh, this is it. it never One minute you're you. the leading lady and the next minute <laughs> you're Aunt Pennyman, but I'm only 38. Wow. I thought it would last a little longer than that. Wow. And then uh, my agents called and said, uh, oh, sorry, we made a mistake. They, they, they want you to read for the part of Catherine Sloper, uh, the heroine of our tale. And then uh, about an hour later, they called back and they said, oh, sorry, we were wrong again. It, it's, uh, they, they, it's an offer to play it's Catherine. Didn't have to so read. I didn't even have to you audition. You didn't even have to read. You just oh, went right so into the corset and right down those stairs. <gasps> because that it was one of those. view of you just coming down those stairs. Well, it really was one of those yeah. roles where you read it and you can feel the muscularity mm -hmm. of the character. You can feel the way she breathes just in the language she uses. Uh, Fiona Shaw, the, the divine one, said in an interview the other day that I think Cicely Berry told her that uh, uh, it's, you know, the language is is the character's rhythm of her mind, mm -hmm. and and Fiona said that once she understood that, she never needed to learn another thing. And if you have Fiona Shaw's mind, you don't have to learn another thing because she's in the so this, yeah. This season she's also. her you know her facility with yeah. everything. But but uh, I felt that way with Catherine. I just yeah. I felt very connected uh, somehow to her. So and <clears throat> you you said just earlier that. You have problem reading. Do you pr have problem memorizing scripts? Cause no, because I, I have such a problem reading. I I memorize them very quickly, so I don't have to read. You know, I mean, I I can't stand. I get lost. I I uh, I lose my place. I I can't concentrate. It has to be acted out. It can't be on the on the page. Um, and I'm and I'm trying to help myself by reading uh, more because I've had to to read so many plays uh, that I, now I'm really trying to get more. I love biography. That's the one thing I love to read. And, and now I'm trying to read more novels just to try to increase my ability to focus on the printed, the printed word. Yeah, you're obviously not working hard enough. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Is it very different doing movies? And, um, have you done any television at all? Uh, almost none. Yeah, none. I what did scares me is so many of the good actresses now, the good New York actresses, mm -hmm. are suddenly in series. And I don't blame them, and they're wonderful in the series, but right. I feel like we're losing people. So, uh, well, I don't. I've never been interested in television because it's. I am. A, I don't know if it's because I'm southern or what, but I am just a, at a slower pace than television. I don't know how people do it. I, it's an impossible schedule, and uh, I think they must all be geniuses that they can learn stuff that quickly and make it seem organic and all of that. I, I, I just, and and. Uh, so many of the dramatic series, I just, I don't, they leave me cold. I just, it's, there's so much gratuitous violence that I hate. I just hate it. I, I think it brings this country down spiritually and, and makes us paranoid as a people. And, um, and I'm not saying I want it all to be well, yes, yeah, we were to, kill a, to yeah. kill a mockingbird, or you yeah. know, I mean, yeah. things that inspire and and give hope, but also are truthful, but but that that give that give hope and and are and educate in 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 the you know, advance the human spirit. That's that's what I would like to see more of, and well, what we're going to need more of. <laughs> Boy, are we! Uh, if you could snap your fingers right now and change one thing for women in the theater, what would it be? Uh, well, I can't think just for women. No. I have to think for everybody. Okay. All right. Just, okay. you know, fantastic federal funding. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's, that's long, long, So you think, long, you long. think it's a financial problem? Well, I don't think it's a fact. I mean, I, I'm one I, of course I, it is, but it's I, I believe that, that, of course, I mean, if, if all the, because we, theater companies around this country depend so much now on corporations and private funding, and as, as the economy fizzles now, and who knows what's coming, going to come next with the economy, you know, we all worry that that, that is now going to dry up for our, our wonderful institutions that hire so many people around this country. 
But the thing is, theater will not die. People just won't necessarily be able to eat while they do it, but it, it will continue to happen in the street and in church basements and in, you know, gymnasiums and wherever, you know, people have to express themselves. But I, it sure would be wonderful if, if um, you know, we could, we could get some support from the government. But I do understand I, it's a democracy and, and uh, you know, no, it's, no, no, but, no, but it's no, our puritanical no. roots. That's, that's exactly it, it. That's what it and is. And there's been and a very conscious attempt since Reagan to marginalize the arts. Right. They keep, the country sort of has the roots to do that anyway. And in mm -hmm. the 70s, people were beginning to think the arts were terrific. Yeah. And then just more and more well, the 60s, demonized it. Yeah. You know, just more and more yeah. demonized to the point where people easily will accept that you can cut that. Yeah. 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 One image that sticks in my mind is at the end of the Tina Howe play, when you were the swimmer, uh -huh. and you actually just dropped off of a pedestal and had people catch you. How did you ever trust people enough to do that? Well, you know what? I stole that from Andre Serban's production of, of uh, The Trojan Women. Uh, I remember this unbelievable woman uh, running with a torch all the way around the top of that scaffolding at La Mama. Oh. And then just before they got to her, uh, somehow the torch was extinguished. And, and she must have been, I don't know, 10 feet up off. off and she, she just leapt. And the last, you, you, the last thing you saw was her leaving that scaffolding. And the lights went out. And you just heard this, what almost sounded like a splat. But of course, it was just flesh against flesh. And I remember, I think Tina had written originally that, that Mabel Tidings Bigelow wades into the, and I thought, how does an actor wade? I mean, that's, <laughs> it's just going to look like bad mime class, you know, <laughs> if I have to wade at the end of that play. So I mentioned it to Jack, and he thought it was a great to idea. Jack so, O'Brien, the so director, I, yeah. I actually got to dive off the play. And sometimes, I, you know, I'd start to show off, and I would, I would, I would get a little too far out, and they'd have to really reach me. But it, with this cast, it was, uh, you know, it was D Dylan Baker and, and, well, I can, I can go through this whole cast yeah. list, and I would love to, but I know we're pressed yeah. for time. But it was an amazing group of people, and we... Um, I would have them catch me anywhere, uh, anytime, and I wish I could get a chance to catch them a few times. It really is. It's a moment of it's Cherry Jones just flying, you know, <sighs> fearless, so much fun. wonderful, Can you imagine reckless at the end theater. of a play to end up in the, you know, in the arms of your fellow cat. I mean, if that um, had been the last thing I'd yeah. ever done, that would have been fine okay, with me. Okay, well, this is the last thing you're going to say to oh, us, okay. unfortunately, <laughs> but very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. I just loved having you here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, it's Cherry Jones, and thank you for joining us. On behalf of the League of Professional Theatre Women, I'm Linda Weiner, and this has been Women in Theatre.